name is Luisa Reichstetter, and uh, I would like to warmly welcome today Helga Novotny. Helga Novotny is former president and founding member of the European Research Council. And not only to me, she's an outstanding scientist working on topics such as social studies of science and technology, macro sociology, and the impact of life sciences on society. She's Professor Emerita of Science and Technology Studies at the ETH Zürich. And before that, she has, among others, worked at the Institute of Advanced Study in Vienna, at the King's College in Cambridge, um, at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes um, in Paris, and um, at the University of Vienna. And I don't really see Helga yet, but um, I hope you're here. Helga, how are you? I am here and now I unmuted <laughs> myself and I hope you can hear me. <laughs> Welcome. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I've been listening to you. <laughs> well, uh, dear Helga, you look back on more than half a century of scientific life. And uh, from a female perspective, um, I'd like to know if you put into a nutshell what has changed the most since you were a law student in the 1950s in Vienna, what would that be? There are two major changes that um, I would like to highlight. One is that I see a growing awareness of women in academia everywhere that um, women have to take account the larger picture that there is indeed a lack of gender equality also in academia, but uh, in order to tackle it, you have to become very pragmatic and you have to, um, you know, it's, it's not so much about the principle per se, the principle is there, everyone knows it, but what to be, uh, what can you do about it? And thus I notice, I would say this is a major change, a growing awareness that translate into a kind of solidarity among women, highlighting, for instance, in a, in, in a panel discussion, when um, a group of <clears throat> established scientists are discussing to promote, and then you have a, a young uh, woman uh, candidate, and you can see the response of the men is very different from the response of the women. And if the women do not speak up for the young female, um, the old white professors will continue to promote perhaps younger but white men. So this is the situation and I think women are becoming aware of this and are <clears throat> counteracting in various ways. The other second major change that I see, and this is the positive side to what has happened since, is indeed we have many more women in top leadership positions. You now have rectors in uh, universities, which was unheard of only 20 years ago. I, I remember when in, in Austria, the first we had the first woman rector ever. You know, this was a major headline in the newspaper. And now, you know, this has become almost a routine that you have women in top leadership positions. Even Max Planck uh, directors have now some women, you know, the, the climax of the academic <clears throat> uh, scientific life. But, um, and this is a but that makes me pause and think, um, if you look at universities in Germany, for instance, you can hardly imagine that there is a rector, whether it's a man or woman, who does not have at least a woman in his or her team. And these women feel the pressure from their colleagues, from the environment. You know, we need a woman in the team, and why don't you join? And they join, but they do not, it's not because the women want to join and because this is their ambition, but because they feel, um, you know, it's almost a service to the community that they also participate as, as women. So I think there is enough for, for further discussion in this, but I would say, you know, this, um, this growing awareness among women and also the support that women give to each other 
by like events like uh, we now share, you share experience, you build uh, trust, you have a support network, um, you exchange um, and, and, and you learn, but you learn also as, as a collective. Um, when I was preparing for that interview, I read an interview um, with you from the year 2001, uh, published in the um, Neue Zürcher Zeitung. And um, I scrolled up that interview twice because I was sure the interviewee was a man because the questions were really rude. Among some questions, uh, the interviewee asked you, did you get your position because they needed a woman? And you answered very, very diplomatic. Yes, but I do my job well. When, <laughs> when did you first feel the desire to become a scientist and why? I also read you were like seven or eight years old when you first put that desire into words. Yes, but this is, this is actually quite, <clears throat> quite common. I mean, um, already as a child or as a youngster, you know, it's, it's an interest. That, uh, so I'm not unique in, in this respect at all. But, um, you know, to, to get a, a, a job, um, there, I think you have to be, um, you have to differentiate. When I, I don't remember this interview uh, at all that you discovered, but um, I probably got the job uh, as a woman uh, because ETH was trying to get more women. But at the same time, you know, I never uh, doubted myself. So I never had this imposter syndrome that some women suffer from um, because I had enough self-confidence that I knew that what I was good in. And uh, <clears throat> therefore, um, I, I, so that's, that's perhaps what I want to say now. <laughs> well, um, maybe not everybody knows, this isn't the first time we two talk to each other and I've been enjoying every single uh, talk we had, but in a previous interview earlier this year, um, um, you gave me and the overtly female audience um, that was in that interview situation an advice um, that made me stumble because you said um, women aiming for a career um, should not disclose private information on their partner, on their family plans, their children, etc. And um, did I understand you? correctly as yes. uh, the time yes. why, why I'm, still, I'm still of this opinion yeah. it's a matter of principle because these are questions that no man would be asked you cannot imagine an interview situation where man is asked do you want to have children <laughs> when do you want to have children or you plan to get married or whatever it is so you know um, if you even imagine a man in your place, you see how ridiculous the situation can become. So this is a matter of principle. And unless women start to refuse to answer these questions, the situation will go on. And, <clears throat> you know, economists have been looking into <clears throat> the question of equal pay since many years. There are many reasons why women get less pay than, than men. But one is that employers, at least this is the economist's version of interpreting it, employers feel, especially when they hire a, a younger woman in, who is still in the age where she would like to set up a family, uh, that they consider it a risk because um, the you know, family and uh, academic life or family and, and professional life are difficult to juggle for women, much more difficult than, than for men, we know this. And you know, the data confirm this. If you hear, I recently saw a figure that really shocked me that in the US, 40% of women in academia quit their scientific career once they become mothers. In Europe, the figures are lower because we have more childcare facilities, but nevertheless, 
So you can say, okay, if the situation is like this and this is the risk, <clears throat> then nothing will change. So I would say, yes, don't get into a situation where you answer these questions, be firm and polite and say, uh, very friendly, would you also ask this question to a man? Well, then, um, from a political perspective, you can only change um, when you have uh, the idea of what you're talking about. So maybe you need more testimonials and more role models to talk about also the compatibility of personal life and professional life to, um, to find out what needs to be changed. And also because you're our um, one and only role model today, and this is not a round table like it um, was last week, I was kindly asked to ask you about um, your private life too. And actually it was hard research work for a journalist to find out something about your family. You were really good at hiding that for more than uh, 50 years. Um, however, I found out that your daughter was only four weeks old when you moved uh, to New York in the 1960s to start a second PhD in a completely different um, discipline. Yeah. How is that moving with a really newly born baby to a different world? Well, you know, again, this is um, something that perhaps we still come to talk about it a bit later. I think it is important um, to have a partner who supports you in scientific, <clears throat> if you want to have a scientific career, if you want to, um, to be successful in academia. Um, so I had a partner who was supportive, but he got a position in New York and I followed him. And uh, this is still something that many women do also dual careers in academia are uh, very often a bit lopsided in the sense that it's very often the woman who follows the man and then you know the university tries to find something for the woman to do etc and it's very rare that the, the the husband or the partner follows the woman so this is how i uh, ended up in, in New York, but then coming back and I moved again. So, you know, in the end, I, I had to start um, with interruptions a couple of times, but probably I had a more interesting life because I um, was um, discovering new areas and um, was not always easy. <clears throat> And I think a role model also has to admit, you know, there are difficult periods, there are failures. But if you know that you want to stay um, in science, in academia, if you're convinced this is something you want to do, you can muster the strength and courage to stick with it. Hmm. It is often stated that women uh, do not assume such high positions um, as you did because they simply have to spend more time for childcare. And um, for instance, before Corona, you couldn't enter the important circles and uh, dinner talks when you had at the same time to be at home and put your children into bed. And you couldn't switch within seconds from childbed to Zoom talk. Um, do you recall your children complaining you had to, or your daughter complaining um, you had too little time uh, for her? And what did you answer to her? Well, I think this is not uh, in any way unique for, for women in academic life. You know, every woman who combines um, work and family with children has the problem how to, how to juggle um, and children are insatiable in terms of time they want to spend with, with their parents, be it the mother or the father or, or, or both. And so I think I was not alone, always having a bit of a bad conscience. Um, this never leaves you completely because you feel you, you, you would like to have more time. On the other hand, there is this concept of quality time 
that you're very, um, that you reserve time where nothing interferes and you're really fully with the child and the child knows this and also knows the difference. So I think there are ways of, of structuring it. And um, let's be very clear about that. I think it's a problem that is not unique to women in academia and women in academia are still enormously privileged to many other women who do not have the additional financial means. It's not that academia pays so well, but um, I know that, you know, I was spending almost all of my salary at one point to have um, proper childcare. But it was a conscious decision because I said, it's worse. I'm not, um, you know, the, the work I do is not to make money. I want to do work because I'm interested in doing it. And therefore, I'm spending um, a large part of my salary to, to have child care that enables me to do what I would like to do. Hmm. At this point, I have to uh, ask kindly ask the audience to put their uh, questions into the chat so I can start asking your questions, dear audience, um, in about one or two minutes. But um, before that, I'd like to ask you another question, um, Helga, um, which takes us back to Vienna again in the 1950s, because there's an anecdote about uh, before you went to New York, how you got a job um, as an uh, assistant professor at the laws department, um, being confronted with a professor saying, bluntly telling you that um, you're probably not getting the job because you're a woman in your early 30s. Um, <laughs> share the story with us, how you got the job anyway. Yeah, he did not put it uh, this way. You know, he was a very, <clears throat> a very kind man and a very well-known professor in criminology and, and criminal law, internationally, very, very respected. He knew me because I had attended a seminar, etc. And then this was a time where you did not have a committee at universities to decide, but her professor decided, you know, this is a position and I will fill it and I'm the only one who, who decides. So I went for the interview and um, at one point um, he said, um, yes, but um, you know, I don't think that I want a woman for this job. <laughs> I respect you, I know you, I know what you did, but you know, I don't think I want a woman. So I said, why not? And then he said, well, it's very simple. I will invest in you because, you know, criminology was, it was very interesting uh, position also. I invest in you, you will get married, you will have children and you will leave. So it's the old story that we were talking about before, you know, the employer takes the risk of the woman leaving and the investment is, is lost. So I said, look, I cannot guarantee that I will not uh, get married or have children. This is, would be ridiculous. But I know that you <clears throat> value also academic merits. And let's make a deal. If you find a man who is better than me, you take the man. So at this point, you know, he could not refuse and I got the job. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, and you left. His invest was... Um, in the end, in the end, I left, yes. <laughs> <laughs> His point was, um, was right. But um, good for us you left because you didn't become um, um, a lawyer <laughs> or um, a professor of law, but um, uh, a philosopher of science. And... Um, in 2007, you were involved in the founding of the European Research Council. You were first vice president, then president of the institution. And um, let me put like the um, idea of the ERC is to award pan-European non-nationally bound research grants um, to scientists. And um, the ERC is supported by the European Union. Um, when you were 
involved in the founding, what were the most important items on your agenda and what did they have to do with the advancement of women in science? Well, you know, it was a very exciting um, um, enterprise because um, scientists in Europe had been asking for many years that the European Commission should also support fundamental research. So not only research that is related to innovation, uh, to, you know, the applied side, but really fundamental research. And there were many conferences and uh, lobby groups, etc. And finally, the European Research Council ESC got, got established. And we were a group of 22 persons in the Scientific Council. And we had um, the freedom to set up um, this funding institution in the way that we thought it would function best for funding fundamental research. So one of my roles was to see that the social sciences and humanities are considered part of what the money is there for. And um, <clears throat> I think I was able to convince my, my colleagues that fundamental research has to be understood in this broad inclusive sense of Wissenschaft of the 19th century concept of Wissenschaft, which is also reflected in the Scandinavian countries, Wetenskap, and <clears throat> the social sciences and humanities are part of it. And then I very early on um, asked also my colleagues to set up a working group to monitor whether in um, the assessment of the applications, we are fair and transparent enough as we were proud to say we were also in the treatment of women candidates. And so from the very beginning, we were carefully looking at the statistics, you know, were women <clears throat> in any way discriminated against, be it consciously or mostly unconsciously. And uh, for instance, we also set up, uh, we, we asked the, 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 the staff of the <clears throat> ESC agency to closely monitor when in the discussions, women were treated differently from men in the sense that you say, well, she is, she, she is a promising young, uh, you know, academic, while for the men, they say, you know, he is young, but he has already done so much. And, and you know, statements of this kind. So they collected it, <clears throat> we screened it, and then we played it back to the panel members and said, look, we are not just speaking abstractly that you have an unconscious bias. You are not aware of it. Listen to what some of you said, treating a man and a woman who both you know, applied for the money. They had reached a stage where they were considered um, in, in, in the shortlist or in interview situations. And they were shocked and they said, we really said this? Yes, we, you said this. So this is something that, you know, I did not uh, think very much about doing it. It seemed very, very self-evident for me that a new institution that prides itself to do something that was unprecedented in Europe also has to look um, whether women are treated uh, equally and fairly to the extent that it's, it's possible. There are some questions in the chat now and um, I'm um, happy to ask some of them. Wiebke Ebert from Hamburg would like to know, uh, know um, what is the best advice for young women to have a chance to properly compete with men for jobs in the scientific field in and outside of academia? Well, Inside is a different question than outside. So, I guess so. You know, I'm not a specialist for outside of academia, but inside academia, I think it is very important that as a young woman who wants to stay in academia, 
that you become aware, watch, um, uh, make, make sure that you know what you, you want to do. What are your interests, your scientific questions that you want to pursue? Why have you chosen these questions? How committed are you? How much does it matter to you to get answers? So in other words, you know, for a scientific career, you need you need curiosity, you need persistence, but you also need a, a, a passion for what you are doing. And um, be honest to yourself. And then comes the second <laughs> start analyzing is the environment in which I find myself or the environment for which I apply. Is this the right environment for me? to be able to do what I would like to do. And if not, <clears throat> you, have, you have three possibilities, essentially. You can either move out and move elsewhere because you feel the environment is not uh, <clears throat> you know, perceptive enough, not receptive enough for, for your interests. It will not let you grow and mature. Then move out and uh, hopefully you find something that is more fitting or you adapt and you stay, but then don't complain. And the third possibility is you find a niche somewhere where you start to build something that fits your own interest. This is the most difficult, but it's also the most exciting. So this is the advice for those who really want to pursue a scientific career. Outside, um, I think there are many um, tips that you can get uh, starting with <clears throat> be confident, etc. But I, I really am convinced the most important thing is that you find out what is it you want to do and why you want to do it. Well, there are questions in the chat um, around that topic, centering around the topic. Uh, for instance, um, Godin Kaur from Paris asks, um, how did you find out what you were passionate about? And is it essential to go for another PhD to change fields? Um, this is a central question because how do you find out what you're passionate about? When I think of myself, I'm not passionate about the same topics um, in 2021, like I was in 2008. My interests have That's changed. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. But, <clears throat> you know, um, in terms of analyzing how your interests change, it also tells you something about yourself and your interaction with the wider world. Now, there are, I mean, many young people these days, beginning with Fridays for Future, et cetera, are really passionately interested in environmental issues. This was certainly not the case like 10, 15 years ago. So, but then again, you have to, to break it down to discover something where you say, okay, um, I want to look more at the ethical side, I want to look more at the economic side, or I would like to combine the ethical with the economic side, or whatever it is. And um, they need to change, but you are also maturing and, and you are also part of the, of the wider world and, uh, you know, the agendas that uh, become of societal relevance. And of course, in science, we always want to, to contribute somehow to the problems that the world faces. I apologize for some uh, microphone difficulties. I don't really know what's the reasons uh, for them, but um, I think we got the point um, you made. And um, I would like to read out another question also by Gordin. And uh, she asks in the second part of her question, if you had mentors and how um, you established to first connect with your mentors. I did not really have mentors. 
uh, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> you know, I um, perhaps because I felt always to be very rather independent also in my, my interests and, and so on. But um, I was always keen um, to learn from other people but not in this personal uh, relationship with someone who mentored me. So this is nothing against mentorship. It's a very personal um, biographical um, point, uh, I, I would say. And um, for instance, I was one asked if I, you know, if I could name somebody whom I admired, et cetera, I really had to think very hard. Uh, <laughs> About it. But then I came up with um, the sociologists know the name with Norbert Elias. Yeah. And Norbert Elias, I, I got to, to know him uh, because he was a, a, a German Jew. He had to leave uh, to, to flee Germany. And then much, much later in his life, you know, he became. <clears throat> famous in, in Germany. Um, and I, I met him at a conference and then we found ourselves by chance together in Bielefeld in, in the ZIF, which was a kind of um, institute for advanced study. And um, I had a car and uh, he was there alone, he lived alone. And so I offered to, could I, you know, when I go shopping, could I bring something for him, et cetera. And so we got to talk more and more. And in the end, we made extended walks through the woods behind uh, the Ziff in Bielefeld, discussing everything, you know, the, the world, his life, uh, et cetera. And I really, apart from, you know, the personal, uh, personally liking him very much. You know, I got to admire him as, as, as a person. But, but he was also a very independent uh, thinker and author, not really. Um, That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, you, he cannot be put in any box and in any discipline and in any um, um, generation and any school. Um, but Bielefeld, uh, Bielefeld is um, interesting because um, you wrote a book together with uh, Karin Hausen, which yes. um, attracted me as a young student in 2004. Uh, it's called um, Wie männlich ist die Wissenschaft? Um, how masculine is science? And it was in the early 80s. Um, in Bielefeld, that you and your colleague Karin Hausen, a historian, um, organized a conference that went, went down in history with this title, How Masculine is uh, Science. Yeah. Um, and even more than 25 years later, I was attracted by the book's title because I had, as a young student, the same, how masculine is science? I only have male professors. I, um, And I took out the book at the university's library and um, I was really, I don't know, I thought it must be very much um, younger than it actually was. What was the conference about and how masculine is science still today? Well, I recently spoke um, to a group of um, women inside the Max Black Society And the leader of the group told me that uh, she had mentioned the book's title to one of her male colleagues who replied, <laughs> and you will not believe it, he replied, of course, science is female because in German it's die Wissenschaft. So this is of course a very stupid uh, reply. <laughs> So, yeah, because the question is not, is um, science masculine in German grammar, but how masculine is science? Yeah, but you can oh. see, you know, the, the kind of <clears throat> warding off um, and um, denial that still exists, obviously, in the Max Planck society. But um, the, it has a, it has a, <clears throat> a Vorgeschichte, we say in German, that there was something preceding the conference. And this was, I was a fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg uh, in, in Berlin. And I was there in the first year and each fellow had to give a public talk. 
Now, this per se is nothing unusual, but as the Wissenschaftskolleg had just been founded, there was an enormous interest on the part of the media. What do these people actually do? Who are they, etc.? And the, the German daily newspaper in Berlin, the Tagesspiegel, ran a kind of uh, critique, like after a theater performance, after every lecture, which was an enormous stress, as you can imagine. You give a public lecture to your colleagues and you have a few people of Berlin, but you know the day after or two days after in the Tagesspiegel, you know, the whole city reads about you. <laughs> so I, I can sympathize with opera singers and actors, the, the kind of stress that this produces. And the title of my talk was Wie männlich ist die Wissenschaft. And it was a very strange evening. I gave my talk and there were the feminists of Berlin in the audience. And Berlin at that time had some very vocal and articulate, highly articulate feminists. This is a helicopter, so it will it will go away. And um, the it, the discussion after my talk was such that the the intelligent men kept quiet. They did not participate in the discussion at all. They were silent. And then there were some stupid men who started to talk. And then, you know, the Berlin feminist, you know, just uh, attacked them <laughs> with vigor. So it was very strange. So the Tagesspiegel wrote about this, etc. But then <clears throat> I, I consulted with Karen Hausen and uh, she said, look, let's do it. Um, let's organize a conference. And, and, and so we did. Now, what was special about the conference is that we decided we would invite women from various scientific disciplines. And in addition, we would in, invite some three to four or five men, but only as commentators. So uh, in Bielefeld during the conference, these men for the first time in their life were in the situation which equals what many women at conferences were going through at uh, the same time uh, as a normal situation. They did not play a major role. And then two of these men who were sympathetic, they considered them feminists or quasi-feminists themselves. They came to me and said, look, I am very sorry, but I have to leave because I feel psychologically I cannot stand it anymore. It's too much for me. I realize it rationally, I can analyze everything, but psychologically I'm unable to take it. So <clears throat> this was an unexpected side effect, um, how vulnerable men would be in a situation that women found themselves constantly. Because the women were talking to each other, the men were there, but you know, they played no role whatsoever. And from time to time, we would of course speak with them, but you know, it, it, was, um, it was a women's conference and very hard for them to take. Um, there is a question in the chat from Imke Rajamani um, from Berlin um, that is very interesting, I think. Um, she asks, um, which role do age and experience play for women to be respected by men in the academic leadership level? In other words, is it easier for experienced older women to receive the men's respect on the academic leadership level than it is for young women? I agree. <clears throat> I agree. And, I, and I'm, then you just agree, but um, I'm, for instance, oh, um, yeah. thinking a lot about when do you stop being young and start being old? Um, I would say it comes with the menopause. Oh, that's a long way to go mm -hmm. uh, for I, I think so. in this uh, session. <laughs> no, it plays, it plays a role because um, men find themselves, especially when they are in a position of authority, 
and have to deal with younger women whom they may find attractive. And now, you know, we know much more about it publicly because of the Me Too movement that yeah. of course exists also in academia. No, no field is exempt. And I think it, the status of women changes um, once you become older, you are more experienced, but I think also the, the kind of, um, let's say, <clears throat> you know, distraction by being um, attractive <clears throat> in addition to being uh, an intelligent woman no longer plays the same kind of role. So this would be my, my answer. And I've seen some empirical work that uh, women become much more productive after, after the menopause. Um, <clears throat> because um, partly, of course, the children are, are, are older, et cetera, but also it releases, it seems to release some kind of energy um, that uh, <clears throat> had helped them had held, held them back be, before. So this may be a controversial answer, but I, I think um, you have to, to analyze it again in a larger picture. Mm. Even more productive, um, we might add, because um, I can't really um, say that with a certainty, but I heard in a, well, I, I read in another article that in 2020 or in 2019, um, for the first time, there were more scientific articles worldwide uh, produced by women and pu published by women than by men. But I can't recall for what area um, in uh, this, um, this um, number um, counted. But anyway, yeah. um, there is more women uh, finishing their studies, at least in Europe, uh, than men. Mm -hmm. And um, there are very many very intelligent and very productive women in academia and also outside of academia. Let me just say something um, shortly to, to scientific publications. Um, as far as I know, this has been well researched and women in general publish less than men in general. And they publish less, um, regardless of what the field is, and you control for children, for partners, whatever, uh, they publish less. And one of the reasons, it's difficult to prove, but one of the possible reasons is that women publish not in a kind of, um, you know, the, the slightest, um, the, the smallest possible slice that you can publish, but they publish um, if they have the feeling, I have something to say, you know, it is something important, and then I publish. So they take it much more seriously when men sort of play with it and, and try to maximize the number of uh, publications quantity above uh, quality. But in during the pandemic, we saw a very sharp drop of women publishing at all, to the extent that funding agencies now, <clears throat> when they check the track record, have to take into account the pandemic years because women published way, way below, below um, their usual uh, publication behavior because they had they were overburdened with family life and family duties. No. Um, actually, there is a, a question in the chat I'd like to um, ask you um, uh, that was asked by Ana Treviso um, from Mexico. Um, how do you see the future of women in science? Um, we've talked about uh, the past more than 50 years and about the presence, but how do you see the future of women in science and what are the challenges that um, we are facing for this future as women? I am optimistic that women in science have a future and um, I can see, you know, very talented young women coming up the numbers, for instance, if you look at the ESC um, grantees, 
um, when I started, you mentioned my time at the EOC. Now we are steadily above 30% of young um, women scientists getting an ESC grant. Before it was below 30%. And now we have reached this, um, this uh, threshold. Now for advanced grant, it's different because de facto you have to be a professor and there's still far fewer women professors than men. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good time to enter science as, as a woman, I would say. But, um, you know, you have to really know and want what you want to do and find also the right kind of environment and um, the support from your partner. And, um... I mean, there's still a long way to go until we may be able to speak of gender equality in science, um, but also of diversity, like real diversity. Um, if um, a young woman who's as smart as she's ambitious um, now gets into a position <coughs> to make a career, um, how can she shape change also towards diversity um what be, would be the most important characteristic about this change well i think um you know much of um, the work in the natural sciences as the norm is carried out um, in, in in a team so it is important uh, to have um what you call qualities as a team player to be a good team player. But for women, it is important not to withdraw or to allow others to put her into the role of um, helping too much what others do. Uh, you know, a kind of caring role, a kind of helping role that for women, it's much easier to fall back into than for men. So be a good team play player, but insist on equality, um, of, on, on equality in whatever you do and in all your dealings with your, with, um, your colleagues in, in the team. And then of course there are the obstacles because you are supposed to move as a postdoc to another country. And then you have this two body problem. Does the partner come with you or not? Uh, what you do, etc. And here, of course, also funding agencies are challenged to come up with, with new ideas. And I know only of one uh, funding agency. This is the, the Israel Science Foundation that has a, set up a small but very original and innovative program to um, allow for if the woman gets selected to, for a fellowship that allows her to move abroad as a, as, as a postdoc, to also offer the husband or the partner possibility to come with her. And this is indeed a, a game changer. So there are ways of also helping here, but it needs support. But overall, I think, um, and this is of course my, my, my dream or my wish for the future, that um, once we do reach gender equality, you are a scientist and it no longer matters whether you are a man or a woman. So now I don't hear you. I don't hear you now. <clears throat> Can you still hear me? Okay. No, sorry, I, I don't hear you. I don't know why. Yeah, I was, um, yeah. I'm no, muted. I'm sorry, I muted myself because okay, I, um, yes. <laughs> I caught a cold and I didn't want to um, snooze into the audience. And then I was unable to unmute myself. I didn't have the rights to unmute myself. So I first had to write the host and the host had to react. So, well, okay. this is Zoom, but um, we're here in a role model talk with Helga Novotny to all of you 
who uh, joined us later. And um, we're talking about female leadership in academia mostly, but not only in academia. And I, I would like to ask a question um, that is personal, but also dealing with um, different ways of uh, staging as a woman. Um, your daughter uh, is a successful journalist at the Austrian television station and your granddaughter, uh, she also studied uh, social sciences, but she approaches the question of justice differently. I um, found her website and she's an activist and musician and she sings uh, Jewish revolutionary songs, among them a very beautiful song, um, Alle Weiber wollen stimmen, uh, that's from the suffrage at time. So every woman wants to vote. And I'd be very interested um, to hear how you three um, women of three different generations uh, discuss female leadership within your family. <laughs> I don't think we discuss it so much. You know, we okay. take it for granted. <laughs> We take it for granted that there is a sort of female line in the family where the older generation passes on something to the younger generation and the younger generation takes it up and makes something out of it. Now, my granddaughter is indeed something very special <clears throat> and um, she will, she, she's, she's uh, an activist, a political activist also. Um, she has a beautiful voice, so, you know, she does not, uh, she, she does her PhD at the University of uh, Music and Performing Arts in Vienna, but uh, the topic is um, Yiddish songs and, um, and what you, um, the songs that you discovered was a song uh, sung in New York in the 1920s at the time when women got the right uh, to vote. And this was part of the revolutionary movement for women voting in, 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 in Yiddish. So um, I would say every, every generation, you know, finds its own space to act, but we feel that there is something that unites us that, you know, I passed on to my daughter, passed it on to her daughter. <laughs> you take it for granted. Uh, that's a good, uh, that's good to hear. Uh, everybody should, including men. Um, there are some last uh, questions in the chat. There are only four minutes left. And I'd like to read out a question um, by Marina Kovaleva. And um, she writes, one of the challenges for female researchers is strong resistance from the male side. Um, so nothing about taking anything for granted. Um, so um, are there any actions aimed at reduction of such resistance apart from enforcing, imposing to accept women? Um, so how I'm trying to, to put the comment into a question. Um, how can we um, change politics and change daily life at universities? So um, what you described as taking for granted um, really um, becomes um, true. Well, <clears throat> let's face it, um, there are still situations in which men have more power than women. And they also exert uh, this, this power in, uh, in hierarchical ways. And um, on the other hand, um, there are, there's a new generation, a younger generation of men who are much more understanding and sympathetic and they also believe in diversity, et cetera. So <clears throat> whatever needs to be done, it has to be done at different levels. There is the level interpersonal level when you are dealing with your, with your colleagues. There's the level of the institute in a larger organization. There's the level of um, the university leadership, but there's of course also the overall political level of having, um, you know, Gleichberechtigungsbeauftragte, et cetera. So there are legal ways 
also to insist um, that you cannot overdo it. Let's put it that way. And of course, um, at each level, it works in a slightly different ways. And change comes about slowly, but it does come about. And the more these levels can be interlinked to go in the same direction, the better it is. Yeah, as you said before, um, change is uh, coming and you're optimistic um, about it. Um, one last question. Um, your new book, in AI we trust is going to be out in October. So I haven't had September. 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 Okay, it says October on the website. Um, yeah, so if it's September, it's written. Um, may I ask you if um, you think or in how far may algorithms help us to overcome gender stereotypes and biases? Well, algorithms don't act on their own. <clears throat> there are people who design the algorithms. Yeah, you have to feed there them are, children. Yeah, there, <laughs> <laughs> there are search engines, you know, that process uh, data and algorithm, etc. So it's a big machinery behind it. And <clears throat> you have to... Um, again, you know, work at, at different levels to make sure, first of all, against discrimination. This is a problem that is recognized by everyone. And even um, translation, Google Translate, you know, it's, um, you, have, you have many examples that show, you know, how scandalous it is to let a Google algorithm translate of course, if it's a, a doctor, it's a man, it's he and not she, et cetera. If it's a nurse, it's she, et cetera. So <clears throat> these are the most blatant uh, examples, but you have to be vigilant all the time. But um, there is no, no simple entry point uh, to say it, it, it will help us. I think as women, we have to participate in so many facets of public life to make our voice heard. And um, so don't, don't be silent, don't remain silent, be visible and, um, and keep on going. Well, thank you. Those were the most beautiful final words. Um, I will not ask any more questions and there are no more questions in the chat. So at this point, thank you very, very much for your time and um, for sharing your role model expertise uh, with us, Helga Novotny. Uh, but also thank you, um, dear audience, for all the questions in the chat. And um, well then, I'm uh, giving back to Magdalena. Thank you and goodbye and uh, goodbye. keep going. <laughs> I will.